together, everyone achieves more. I'm Jordy Delight, and this is Team Spirit. My name is Jordy Delight. I'm a non binary artist based in sunny Scotland, and I've got a confession to make. I can't kick balls. Well, I can't play football. And some of you might find this hard to believe, but my name Jordy comes from wearing a Newcastle football strip as a child. And the closest thing I've got to football in my adult life is footballers' wives. But we're in 2022, things are changing. So could a drag queen play football? Let's find out. Being a part of the LGBTQI community has taught me a sense of freedom, friendship, and the value of family. Someone who joined me on that journey when I was 18 was my good friend Lucy from high school, who is also a huge fan of the Hibs Club. Join me for this interview where I share her amazing story. Persevere. Many memories in here. So can you tell me where we are today, Lucy? Yeah, we're in the Persevere pub at the bottom of Easter Road. Amazing. Right next to our old school. Our old school? Well, go and tell me something, Lucy, right? Obviously, we're both from Leith, right? We went to school together yep. and we've known each other for quite a bloody long time, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. Unfortunately for you, no for me. No, not at all. What is the slogan and the sort of mantra of Leith? So it is persevere. So it's like, if it's failing, like just try again. Um, and as a Hibs fan, that is definitely something that sticks with us. I've mo I moved to Edinburgh when I was like five um, with my mum and, and uh, our partner at the time. And from then I've, I've supported Hibs. I went to near enough every Hibs game, different cup finals, um, and just like absolutely fell in love with it. And then played, played football at school. Um, I was part of the, the girls team and then I played football for Hibs ladies. I think it's important that the club shows that it's you know it's accepting and it's inclusive as you say and I think that's the difference there the education piece just to say look we're happy that you're inclusive and as a as an individual and you don't feel like it needs to be kind of branded but actually it does need to be branded and we do need to know that football and me being gay has never been like a, a thing to me like it's never been like oh now I'm out maybe it's going to be different or anything I've always felt like I was included I was, I've always felt as a as much as a fan as the guy sitting next to me or the girl sitting next to me or whatever do you know so um, yeah, I loved it and also yeah I'm gay so that's it um, I mean when we win a game or we win a cup or something we sing Sunshine and Leith and it's, it's like a love song but it's, it's the best thing ever and the emotions and it would be nice just to see like oh like Hibs fans come together and sing this amazing song and, and they did when we won the cup but I, I just think we should see more positives, like, oh, there was a lovely engagement here, or, do you know, cover it. Obviously, they want to catch a reader's attention, and by doing that, it's like, here's the drama. But I think we need some more positives in there, for sure. As someone who identifies as non-binary, it never occurred to me that football could help affirm someone's gender identity. But then I met Arthur Webber, a young trans man based in London, who did work with Stonewall UK on his relationship with football. Arthur Weber, thank you so much for joining us and doing this documentary. It's absolutely brilliant and a delight to have you. Could you introduce yourself for me? Uh, hi, I'm Arthur Weber. I use he, him pronouns. I've been an Arsenal supporter since I was about six. And yeah, I'm annoying on Twitter, I guess. <laughs> Do you know, I find your Twitter really um, amazing, actually. I love a lot of the tweets you post. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I've been into football uh, my whole life because my dad at least used to be really into it. He's not so much into it now. Um, so like one of my dad's friends uh, ran a boys um, football training on a Monday and my dad was like, can he come along? Like, is it going to be a problem? And my dad's friend was like, nah, it's fine. So it was still advertised as being boys only. And there was me. So I was like, "Ooh, that's nice because uh, they did have a separate girls training on another day of the week, but it wasn't done by my dad's friend. So the club were like, no, no, it's, it's fine. He can come here. And um, so like football for me was always very gender affirming because I was always around boys for my primary school team. Again, it was advertised as mixed sex, but it was only me that wasn't assigned male at birth there. So, you know, it would be referred to as the boys and things, and that was fine. 
and nobody kicked up a fuss. It was only when I got to secondary school when everything started being divided by sex that I was like, ah, okay, uh, something's not quite right here. Because I played for my secondary school women's team for a couple of years. Um, but then when I properly realized I was trans and found out that transitioning was possible and that, that sort of thing, I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. This isn't where I belong. So I just stepped back and hadn't played until last week. So that was 10 years ago that I last played. So it was a very long time away, but yeah, I'm glad to be back. Uh, the team I currently play for is an LGBT team, so we don't really have the same levels of toxic masculinity. It is largely men. We, we had a trans woman along this week, um, but last week it was all men and mainly cis men as well. They said they told me in the pub afterwards that they have had trans male players before, but they didn't have any currently, so it was just me. Um, but I, I was very open about it there like I didn't I didn't see a problem in sharing that I was trans with these guys because a lot of them it turns out followed me on Twitter beforehand like I came to put my boots on and then one of them was like I, I think I recognize you from somewhere and I was like yeah it'll be it'll be the internet so I, I didn't have a problem there in terms of like going to games and stuff I was a bit nervous about going because uh, me and my partner had been victims of hate crime a couple of weeks beforehand so yeah I think being involved in the LGBT supporters group has made it much more accessible. I don't think I ever would have gone to a game otherwise because I just wouldn't have felt safe. It's just been really, really nice just being able to walk into a game, like especially with it being an LGBT team and not having to worry about all the other stuff I normally worry about with football. Like, you know, am I presenting too gay? Am I too obviously trans? Like, there's no problem there because most of the guys there are far more effeminate than me. Uh, my partner actually said that he really enjoys going to gay football games because he gets to hear all the squealing that you don't get to hear <laughs> in normal games and things. And, you know, the banter is different, like, because, you know, they're joking about, you know, being with guys and other things and stuff that I can relate to, whereas, you know, a game full of straight players, I'm not going to relate to a joke about a woman or whatever because I've never been with one. So it's just, it's very nice and everybody has really made an effort to come over and speak to me and make me feel involved. Like, it doesn't seem to much be a problem with the players because so many players, when, you know, Josh Cavallo came out last year, were so, so openly supportive. I think it's the fans they're afraid of. And so it's trying to change the fan culture, I think. And we're only going to do that with more queer, queer people stepping forward and saying that I like football, I'm here, you're not going to scare me off. So, yeah. Well, when the Premier League ones come, I think that will be the real changing point for queer people in football. But then it's like, until the Premier League ones comes, are the Premier League players going to feel comfortable enough to come out? So it's very much a vicious circle of which is going to happen first, I guess. With the news of Josh Cavallo coming out as an openly gay footballer, it only felt right to go to someone in the big league, pun intended, and visit Chief Executive of Glasgow City FC, Laura Montgomery. Laura Montgomery has given a TED Talk on feminism in football and queer identity. Let's go to Glasgow and see what she's all about. As a kid, I loved football. I mean, I just played it all the time. Played it in the garden, played it at lunch times. I did that all the way through, um, well, all the way through primary, high school. You know, when I went home from school, I played it in the streets, I played it in the garden, just non-stop. But the challenge for me was, of course, I, I couldn't play for a team. So I went to Glasgow Uni and uh, wandering around Freshers Week, found that there was a stall for women's football, which was a revelation. So I thought, oh my God, I can actually play for a team here. So I played for the university team. And when I was in that team, that's when I kind of discovered that there was actually a senior women's football set up. At the time, particularly when I got injured and obviously my whole week wasn't around training and playing, it was starting to look at you know what existed, the grounds we played on the sponsors we had, how we, were, how we were treated. You know, we always got the last of the referees or if there was a, a boys and a men's team on, we could get kicked off the pitch. You know, it just wasn't really great. So just decided that really to try and take our destiny in our own hands and, and that we really wanted to create, you know, the best team and have as many opportunities we could for young girls to play and, and women to play. So, yeah, we decided that the only way we could do that was to start our own team and that's what we did. Um, in England, they actually, the FA actually banned women playing. In Scotland, they didn't ban women playing, but they had the same effect where they banned, they banned football stadiums from allowing women to play. So it has the same effect. If, if, you, can't, if you can't play a game on a pitch, then you've, you've virtually banned the women's game. And then you go to the 70s when um, 
UEFA asked all of the associations, so all the different countries, obviously the football associations, all to formally adopt women's football. Scotland was the only nation that said it wasn't going to do so. Now, in the end, they had to say yes, because every other nation had said yes, but Scotland was the only one that, that voted no. So against that backdrop, you can see we've been up against it. But now, um, you know, we have come a long way. I mean, I, I, I wanted, I'm I, one of these people that didn't know I was gay, never really thought about it. But probably that was because, again, going back to a time where there was no gay role models on television. You know, I'd watch Coronation Street, nobody in Coronation Street was gay. You know, back to it not being part of my day-to-day life. It was never discussed. It was never mentioned at school. I'm never one of these people that feel we should force people to come out about their sexuality. Um, I think it's a very personalised thing. And particularly when, you know, whilst we still have stigma and we still have marginalised groups, then we do need to have have areas for them to kind of live and enjoy and grow within that. You know, the world doesn't change unless you, you, you make it. So, you know, for us, we champion a lot to do with equality, diversity, inclusion. We do a lot around mental health, but particularly, you know, with girls, which is our, our focus, and we've very deliberately chosen to only ever be a girls and women's club because we want them to be the most important at all times. And sadly, you know, that just wouldn't be the case as part of a wider club. But, you know, we still have all the terrible stats of, of girls just not being active enough. Um, you know, girls not... And it's all got to do with... I say this a lot in the TED Talk, but you can't be what you can't see. So for us, it, it was to kind of a, a fight to have our, our role models more visible. And it's not that role models have never existed. You know, there's, there's loads of role models for women and girls. They've just not always been visible. So... Where does this leave us now? Well, since my interview with Lucy, she's manifested and the Hibs Club have decided to do an LGBT supporters group for those who identify as lesbian, gay, bi or trans. And after my interview with Arthur Webber, you'll never believe this, a Premier League footballer called Jake Daniels from Blackpool FC came out as the first openly gay footballer in the United Kingdom. And with women like Laura Montgomery championing women's football, Maybe it's time for me to dust off the football boots and start training. The future of football is looking bright, colourful and hopeful. And to me, that's the real goal.